Much of the book of Deuteronomy is Moses simply rehashing what the Israelites had gone through over the previous 40 years in the wilderness. He reminds them of their rebellions, of their striving with God, of God's miraculous provision for them, the great victories he brought about. He revisits the giving of the Ten Commandments. He revisits the golden calf and even some of the prayers that he made along the way. At the end of this morning's reading from chapter 9, we have an example of such a prayer that Moses made. He had just rehearsed the incident of the golden calf and the wrath of God that followed, and then gets to the prayer that he made at the time. So this is how chapter 9 ends. I prayed to the Lord, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your heritage, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not regard the stubbornness of this people, or their wickedness, or their sin, lest the land from which you brought us say, Because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land that he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to put them to death in the wilderness. For they are your people and your heritage, whom you brought out by your great power and by your outstretched arm. The basic structure of this prayer is a doublet. There are two pairs of petition and reason. Uh, petition, you know, asking for something, and then a reason for, you know, for why, why we're asking this petition. The, the, this petition and reason pattern is a, one of the main features of the Collect, actually, uh, that our prayer book tradition is full of. We have lots of Collects, and you know, the petition and reason ingredients of a Collect are very important for how they fit together. And so it's kind of neat to see that this prayer is kind of like two collects strung together. Very, very similar prayers in a sort of repetition style. So just to walk through it, um, the first petition there is do not destroy your people. And the reason that follows is sort of, an imp is sort of implied. Um, they are your heritage, whom you have redeemed, whom you have brought out. Uh, so, you know, asking for mercy. Don't destroy this people because these are your people. You redeemed them. You saved them from Egypt. Um, so the, the expectation or implication there is that God made promises to this group of people and he should not be destroying them. Then in the middle of this prayer, there's an appeal. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, we'll get back to that in a moment. The second petition with second reason is very similar to the first. Do not regard the stubbornness of this people, or their wickedness, or their sin. And then the reason for that is that lest the land from which you brought us up should basically mock the Lord. Now there's a sort of long quote there, like, let the, let the enemies of, of God's people not say all that stuff about you know, God taking them out of Egypt just to kill them in the desert. Uh, so... Please don't, you know, don't regard the stubbornness of this people or their wickedness or their sin because, you know, we don't, you don't want the people to be mocking you, O oh Lord. And, as he says again at the end, they are your people and your heritage. So there's the repetition. Now, in the middle, as I mentioned briefly, there is a very interesting feature. It's like an, an appeal, basically. It's just right there. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. Okay. I remember them. I'm sure God remembers them. Yes. So what, what's that doing there? Why is Moses suddenly making this appeal to ancient ancestors of God's people? Well, this is teaching us two profound truths. One it teaches us about the communion of saints. And two, it teaches us that we earthly sinners need intermediaries to ensure our connection with God. 
so those are both very big concepts and very big claims. Uh, I don't want to spend forever unpacking that, but just to give um, a, a brief explanation of this so that we can learn from this prayer and you know, bring it into our own prayers and our own Christian living, let's take a look at it briefly. So about the communion of saints, this is an organic living whole. All God's people are one body. So we benefit from the faithfulness of others. You know, he, he's, he's saying, hey, this people <laughs> that you've just brought out of Egypt and have, have brought through, um, you know, the Red Sea and, and, and fed in the wilderness for all these years, these are the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You made promises to them. They were faithful eventually. <laughs> um, and so uh, they, this, their descendants deserve to benefit from the faithfulness of their forefathers. And so with the communion of saints, we benefit from the faithfulness of others. And um, we, uh, the departed are still with us. They are still significant to us. You know, those who die in the Lord are, are not truly dead in the fullest sense. They are alive to Christ. There is also a sense in which we all stand or fall together. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer together. Um, you know, St. Paul taught us this as well. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Not just because it's the nice thing to do, but because we are connected with one another as the body of Christ. And so having that reality is uh, very important to live out. And then that second point, we earthly sinners need intermediaries to ensure our connection with God. Now, this might be a bit strange to the modern Christian ear, but it was totally, absolutely common sense at that time, and for most of, most of history, I would probably say. Um, God is holy. God is perfect. God is omnipotent. We are nothing compared to that. And once you throw sin into the mix, we are absolutely not even remotely worthy of any of his attention at all. Yes, God loves us, and that's a marvelous thing, and sometimes we don't fully appreciate just how marvelous that is. But despite that love, our sin separates us from his holiness, and unless God, it has, unless God denies himself to overlook our sins, there is no way we can ever reasonably expect that he will hear our prayers. So we need an intermediary, someone more holy than ourselves, to bridge the gap and you know reach out and and be the the connection. You know, if you think of the uh, the famous Michelangelo painting where God is reaching down and Adam is reaching up, you know, they don't quite touch. That's the that's that's an illustration of the reality of sin. We we cannot connect. Someone has to stand in between and hold God's hand and Adam's hand. Uh, so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are being appealed to here as sort as 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 a sort of intermediary. Um, you know, they were um, more holy than these barely faithful Israelites. Um, you can also see this in the priesthood that was established uh, around this same time from Aaron and his sons and their descendants, that they were meant to be intermediaries, that you know God set them apart to be people who prayed for Israel. And the Israelites would bring their prayers and their sacrifices to these priests who would then bring them to God as a sort of go-between. But ultimately, our perfect intercession, intercessor, our perfect intermediary, is the great high priest Jesus. Only through him do we have access to the Father. And this is made very explicit throughout the New Testament and especially in the epistle to the Hebrews. So we have to remember that, that um, you know, Jesus being both God and man is the go-between between between God and us. So we don't Need we, we don't appeal to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as intermediaries. We acknowledge them as part of the communion of saints, however. So we can still pray, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember um, your servants, the, the 
the eleven apostles plus Matthias who replaced Judas. We can say, remember, um, you know, the faithful and you know great saints who have gone before us. Um, but we don't need to appeal to them as intermediaries because that's the role that Jesus has fulfilled, particularly on the cross. Although that's very much a work also of his incarnation, just by being human and God, both fully, um, that is in himself a bridging of the gap, a creation of something new that definitively and permanently connects the human race back with the divine. So when you're thinking about your own prayers and your own life, your own living as a Christian, you, you have to remember that that sometimes tempting mentality, me and God, that is never going to work. Jesus has to be our link to the divine. You know, you cannot discover divinity within yourself. There is no inner light that dwells within you apart from the gift of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, taking that, you still can't even say me and Jesus, as many Christians like to try to do today. That is never going to work either, because we are bound in Christ to his whole mystical body. The communion of saints is an organic living whole, and we are all part of it. We cannot deny it, because if we do, we're denying the very thing that Christ has brought us into. You can't claim adoption as a child of God without acknowledging that there are lots of other adopted childs, children of God around you, and you belong with them, and we all belong together. So those are some thoughts that we can draw out of Deuteronomy chapter 9 and the prayer that Moses shares or reshares there. And I hope that's an encouragement to you to, uh, you know, consider your prayers, consider your living, and um, yearn for the return to, you know, the gathering of the church for corporate worship together, uh, but also um, the reality that we need to rely on one another for holy living and for growth and in the knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. So keep praying, keep the faith, and God bless.